Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and I want to welcome you to this year's Theodore White Lecture on Press and Politics. This event was originally scheduled for last December, but uh, the speaker informed us that he wanted to go to Florida for some odd reason, <laughs> or that he might at least be detained there probably for longer than he expected, and so we reconvened this evening. The Theodore White Lecture commemorates the life and career of one of America's great journalists, Teddy White, who created the style and set the standard for contemporary political journalism and campaign coverage. Theodore White studied Chinese history and Asian languages at Harvard in the 1930s and originally planned a career as a scholar. But after witnessing the 1939 bombing of Chongqing, he devoted his career to journalism. Uh, over two decades, he established a solid career as a reporter and commentator, including working in East Asia for Time magazine. But it really was his coverage of the 1960 political campaign and the making of the president that changed the course of American political journalism with the depth and breadth of its perspective. His subsequent making of the president volumes and other works of reportage and analysis were informed by the same combination of passion and erudition. Before his death in 1986, Theodore White also served on the Kennedy School's visiting committee, where he was one of the early architects of what would become the Shorenstein Center on Press and Politics. Past Theodore White lecturers have included such illustrious figures as William S. Buckley, Koki Roberts, Walter Cronkite, and the Reverend Jesse Jackson. And this year, we're proud to have as our lecturer Tom Brokaw, one of America's most respected and recognizable figures as the long-term anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly News, and I might add, a best-selling author. Indeed, he confessed at dinner tonight that for over two years and six weeks, he has been on the bestseller list. And all I can say to my fellow faculty members at the Kenny School is, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> to introduce Tom Brokaw, let me present Alex Jones, director of the Shorenstein Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Alex himself is a renowned journalist and media scholar who's worked for the New York Times, National Public Radio, and PBS, and is a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize, uh, and is director, of course, of our Shorenstein Center. Alex. Thank you, Joe. I once saw Tom Brokaw do something I would characterize as gallant. It had to do with his status as one of the nation's most celebrated broadcast journalists and with the pain that sometimes goes with being a famous anchorman. It was about 15 years ago. Tom Brokaw, Peter Jennings, and I were on a panel together discussing media coverage of the Middle East. Our audience was a huge auditorium packed with journalism students from all over the New York area. Just before showtime, a very attractive young woman, I remember that she had very long, very red hair. She came, the only word that I could really use ad accurately, she came undulating <laughs> up to the table where we were sitting. And she had a camera in her hand, who, I wondered, was she after? Would it be Brokaw or Jennings? <laughs> Leads us to say I was not in the running. <laughs> she made for Brokaw. She stood in front of him, twisted finger in her hair, and said something that essentially came across sort of like, would you do something for me? <laughs> Tom nodded and gave her that look of his, we've all come to know, sort of kindly, tolerant, slightly bemused grimace. <laughs> With that, she smiled sweetly and said, would you take my picture with him? <laughs> the gallantry I spoke of was that he took the picture. <laughs> I'm deeply honored to have Tom Brokaw here tonight to deliver the 11th annual Theodore H. White Lecture on Press and Politics, which is one of the most important moments of the year for the Shorenstein Center. Teddy White, as Joe Nye said, was one of the early architects 
for what became the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. He was, for years, a member of the Kennedy School's Visiting Committee. This annual lecture honors Teddy White's distinguished career as a journalist and historian, whose specialty was political and campaign coverage. As Joe said, Teddy's book, The Making of the President 1960, changed political coverage forever by taking readers behind the veil of political campaigns, showing the always messy and even ugly process of struggling to win a presidential election. It was Teddy White who, for the first time, told the inside the campaign story, the human story, the behind the scenes story. He got that story by watching the candidates every move, was present at every moment, and scribbled down all the little personal details that he used to paint word pictures that brought the scenario of the campaign vividly to life. What many people don't know was that years later, Teddy White saw that his repertorial innovation had become not just used, but to his mind, terribly abused. By then, it was common practice for campaign reporters to give candidates much less room to be off their guard, and the candidate's zone of privacy had essentially collapsed. As for having been the man to popularize that method of reporting, Teddy said, and I'm quoting him, I sincerely regret it. And he said that during those relatively tranquil days when George McGovern was running for president. I shudder to think what Teddy White would think of the way the media cover campaigns now. Tom Brokaw began covering presidential election campaigns for NBC News in 1968. How much has television campaign coverage changed since then? Here's one telling statistic. In 1968, the average soundbite of a presidential candidate on the television network Evening News was 42 seconds. In the 2000 election, the average presidential candidate's soundbite on the nightly news had shrunk from 42 seconds to about seven seconds. In fairness, it should also be noted that the average quote from a candidate on the front page of the New York Times had gone from 14 lines to about six. Tom Brokaw has been one of the nation's most important journalistic figures throughout those years of profound change in the way the media do their work. For nearly 20 years, he's been the anchor and then managing editor of the NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. He's won virtually every broadcast honor journalism offers. Not virtually, he has won every offer, every important honor. The, the uh, Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, the Peabody, the Emmy, and many others. One of my particular favorite pieces of his work is the, the documentary special in June of 1997. And somehow this sort of captures Tom Brokaw for me. It was called Tom Brokaw Reports, Why Can't We Live Together? which probed the realities of racial segregation in the nation's suburbs, something that has long been avoided and ignored. This was a production of Dateline NBC and, yet, and won yet another DuPont Award. The thing that sets Tom Brokaw apart may well be the way he communicates an abiding decency and comes across as a man with a commonsensical, thoughtful sense of citizenship, which is a word I don't use lightly. I think this springs largely from his roots in the prairie of South Dakota. Perhaps the purest expression of this vision of America has been the two wildly successful books he has written, The Greatest Generation and The Greatest Generation Speaks. These two books gave recognition to the generation of depression in World War II as though they were being seen and appreciated for the first time, especially by their children and by their grandchildren. As many of you know, Tom's lecture was to have been delivered shortly after Election Day. He was otherwise occupied. It was Tom who has provided probably the most quoted line from that very peculiar night for network television news that was Election Night. And what he said was something along the lines of, it wasn't egg on our faces, we were draped in omelet. <laughs> <laughs> you 
It is because Tom Brokaw and the other anchors are invested with such trust that they bear an extra responsibility. Have, in fact, the networks used that very credibility and trust as a kind of cover for changes in the quality and values and scope of network news, changes that many perceive to be overall for the worse? It's a big question. Certainly, the work of network news has changed drastically, even in the last few years. They took away Brokaw's chair, for one thing. But in more important ways, the network evening news that he began leading in 1983 is widely perceived to be profoundly different from the program that he now appears on. He has been a witness to those changes. Indeed, has been one of the people at NBC who shaped change. It is because he takes the news seriously that we asked him here to talk about those changes. Tom Brokaw. Thank you, Alex, very much. Uh, Dean and I, Walter, all of you who are students and honored guests here tonight, it's a great privilege to be here. Alex, I don't remember the incident to which you refer. <laughs> You're a New York Times man. I would not question your credibility. Let me just say I hope the picture didn't turn out. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been invited here. I am sorry for the more than 60-day delay. Fitter White was one of my earliest role models and heroes in journalism, and he was someone I got to know when he worked for a time for us at NBC News covering politics. We're very happy to have his son with us here tonight as well. He did bring the most robust passion for the subjects that he covered of any journalist that I think I had ever encountered. And he did show us the way, and I might disagree with him to some small degree about whether or not he altered the way that we covered politics in a negative fashion. Let me also say that I always approach this academy with a sense of trepidation and awe. It was reinforced when I walked into this forum this evening and came through a class of bright young Harvard students gathered just off this floor with one of their professors who raised his hand and said, Mr. Brokaw, one of our students has a question for you. I steeled myself knowing that these are Harvard students after all. <laughs> what is it that he may want to know about the balance of power between Russia and the United States in the post-Cold War era, <laughs> about the banking crisis in Japan, about the state of race relations in America. The young man cleared his throat and said, why do you stand when you're delivering the news? <laughs> My fear is that he may be preparing a 40-page senior thesis on why I stand. <laughs> I come to you as a wannabe. I think anyone who has not been a student at Harvard carries that in their mind and in their heart. Now, in 1957, out on the prairie of South Dakota, I was recruited by Harvard. It's one of those provincial balance things that they were doing at the time. They found six young men from the eastern half of the state and put us through the rigors of trying to determine whether we were not just worthy of admission, but also eligible for the enormous amount of financial aid that would be required to get us into this great institution. And the admissions committee, in its wisdom, at the end decided that I might be happier elsewhere. <laughs> So I come before you as someone who has been forced to wander <laughs> for more than 40 years <laughs> in that cold, hard place reserved for people who have no Harvard degree, <laughs> wondering what might have come of me if I had only gotten <laughs> a Harvard education. doesn't mean that I don't pay attention 
to what's going on at Harvard. I noticed that there's now a renewed discussion about what you're going to do with that modest little endowment that you have here. <laughs> I happened to be at class day 2000, had a niece graduating from Harvard. We did get some members of the family in. And I loved Conan O'Brien, a Harvard graduate who got up and he referred to the alumni director who shared the stage with him. And he said, he's going to call and ask you for money. <laughs> and your first response must be, what are you doing with the money that you already have? <laughs> now I see that there is a more lively discussion about the $19.4 billion in the Harvard Endowment. A modest suggestion from an outsider, a graduate of a small land-grant university. You could set up in this building alone with just a small portion of that endowment a permanent office of presidential pardons that would carry us through the remainder of the 21st century. The title of my speech tonight, and it came rather swiftly and improvisationally when I was called by Alex saying, what are you going to talk about? And I said, kind of off the top of my head, so much information, so little time. Friends of mine have suggested it would be more appropriate, given the state of our business these days, to say, so much information, so few facts. <laughs> so much time, so little news. So much Matt Drudge, so little Walter Cronkite. But we will press forward here this evening. I will outline, in the broadest possible terms, some of my reflections on the state of what I believe is the most exciting time I have ever been witness to in this age of information and communication and some of the reservations that I have. I will concentrate primarily on the electronic side of the spectrum. My brothers and sisters in the print world have no reservations about commenting on what it is that we do, but I find that they're not terribly tolerant when we comment on what they do, so I will let them have an evening of some mental relaxation here tonight. It is worth remembering that there was a time not so long ago when darkness came in the early evening. Only two planets lit up the skies over America in the news world. The Huntley Brinkley Report on NBC, and the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. All across this republic, families gathered by appointment to share an evening meal and the experience of first 15 minutes and then a half hour of news programming. I was part of that audience. I was an impressionable and ambitious teenager in the small towns of the Great Plains. My nose pressed up against the glass of this magical view of a world well beyond my ordinary surroundings. It was, in many ways, a transforming expansion of the universe occupied not only by my working class family, but by millions of others across the television landscape. We were witness in our own homes for the first time to the events that defined our lives, political conventions and elections, scandals and triumphs, disasters and great advances in the social contract with America great social causes, the civil rights movement, the anti-war protests were beamed directly into our living rooms. Still, for all their illumination, those two planets still had deep shadows where other forms of life were not nurtured. Racial issues were covered extensively, but gender issues were not. Indeed, very few women had any role in determining reporting or commenting on the news. Moreover, in retrospect, the reporting on racial issues was mostly a black and white equation. There was very little reporting of the profound changes within the black culture, positive and negative. The race for space was a marquee event of those early network news broadcast, but the breathtaking advances in the health sciences were little noticed. Cancer, its origins, prevalence, and treatment was a subject ignored socially and editorially. In foreign news, there was a heavy reliance on Europe, the Middle East, and the Cold War, 
But Asia, apart from Vietnam later, had little coverage, especially about the extraordinary political and economic evolution of the region from Japan and Korea to Singapore. At home, rock and roll was treated, if at all, as a curiosity and not as a transforming popular cultural event of the time. In some circles to this day, perhaps even in this room, the NBC News decision to leave the nightly news broadcast with the death of Elvis Presley still is considered a heresy, a hinge event representing a break from the secular sacraments of traditional news. The changing role of the young as represented by the most clearly defined generation of the 20th century, the baby boomers, was little noticed outside of the protest context. There was a heavy reliance on Washington hearings, too often without a clear-eyed appraisal of their merit or impact. It was a world reflecting the interest of the people who made the decisions, most of them white, middle-aged men from a common culture along the eastern seaboard. These were serious professionals of unquestioned integrity and intelligence who understandably reflected the sensibilities of their time and their place. They were my role models and my mentors. After all, I aspired to their place and I shared their interest, by and large. As someone who expected to be white and middle-aged myself, I was content to follow their lead as I set out on my own journalistic pilgrimage across America and around the world. Now, back to the future. Were I a teenager in South Dakota in the year 2001, I would have access to three full-throated networks, three full-time cable news channels, and a local news cable channel as well, two financial news cable channels, three sports networks, a history channel, a biography channel, two cable channels broadcasting public policy discussions all day, every day, a wide-ranging public broadcasting system with its own evening news and an award-winning documentary unit. I could probably watch the BBC News at 10 as well with a keystroke, with a keystroke on the ubiquitous computer in my home. I could call up more than 150 websites devoted exclusively to news and information. I could, in my small home in South Dakota, read the New York Times before leaving for school, as well as check out the box score for my high school team's basketball game in the local paper. What would not have changed is that I would have had fewer points than almost anyone else in the starting five. <laughs> so which universe is best equipped to serve the public and the place of journalism in a free society? As grateful as I am to the founding fathers of broadcast news for their vision, their standards, their commitment to the idea of news on the new medium of television, I have to conclude that the new universe physically is richer, more accessible, and more far-reaching in terms of its cosmos as a, of news, information, and communication. To be sure, we are living through something that is still in development. It is a universe of considerable chaos, still in formation, imperfect in many of its elements. It represents, I believe, another form of the Big Bang. We have a vast new universe of enormous potential upon us almost every night, and it demands our undivided attention. As we engage this process of review and definition, recommendation and implementation, some historic context is in order. The first is that this new universe, especially in cyberspace, is far more egalitarian than in the days when a handful of press lords pursued their personal political agendas. William Randolph Hearst, Colonel Robert McCormick, the Chandlers in Los Angeles, and Henry Luce at Time, Inc. were in journalism not just for public service, but for profit and for the fulfillment of their personal ideologies. Edward R. Murrow was an icon of those who followed him. But Walter Winchell was at least as persuasive, if not more so, to his audience which was at least as large, if not more so. We lived through the O.J. Simpson trial and the funeral of Princess Diana. 
the Lindbergh kidnapping trial, the Sam Shepard murder case, and the marriage of Wallace Simpson to the Duke of Windsor created the same kind of frenzy. We may have known too much about Bill Clinton's sex life and not enough about John Kennedy's. Does anyone believe that Adolf Hitler, in the modern era of communication and information, could have prevailed for as long as he did? There were more debates in the presidential campaign of 2000 than in all the campaign years in modern presidential elections. Sunday morning has become a regular appointment for students of American politics and policy well beyond what it was in the era when Meet the Press and Face the Nation were the only outlets at 30 minutes apiece. Even as the quantitative expansion of the new universe is breathtaking in its scope, it is the qualitative nature of this new reality that draws us to this occasion and others. Does it represent a step forward in the unending quest to know better the perils and possibilities of the precious time that we have in this life? Or is it a retreat to the lowest common denominators of fear and titillation? The short answer, it is all of the above. Just as in Alice's Restaurant, you can find just about anything you want. The news viewer is empowered as never before to explore a wide range of interest to personally determine his or her own daily informational needs and curiosities and to check them against other sources of information. But for that viewer and for those of us on the other side of the screen, the old order of trust and credibility, integrity and independence requires a constant and vigorous re-examination. It is especially true given the pressures of time and the meteor shower of information real and imagined in modern personal and professional lives. It is under assault every hour because of a simple fact. The new order has a voracious appetite for something, too often anything, to fill the time. That, in turn, has led to what can only be described as not just pack journalism, but mob journalism. It is not an entirely new phenomenon, the gathering of all parts of the journalistic tribe around an event, manufactured or spontaneous, but it is seldom reporting in the classic sense. It is more closely akin to daycare. It is a live camera, a warm body, and an event, any kind of an event, however banal, that may or may not lead to something meaningful or entertaining, preferably the latter. Hot pursuits on California freeways are the maddening apotheosis of this modern curse, but they are not the only examples. Small change hostage situations, calculated stunts by lesser presidential candidates, contrived protests by activist groups of undetermined origin and size all are much more likely to get much more attention than warranted in the current climate. That is not to say the various new media must be restricted entirely to a diet of eat your spinach news. They do have the time and the space to do what television does best, which is to transmit experience in the words of Reuben Frank, the founding father of the Huntley Brinkley Report. Transmit experience. Share with the viewers what is going on at any given time. Mr. Frank, a bookish intellectual and visionary, also regularly reminded his reporters and producers that it was not their place to be above the news. But what he expected is that in the transmission of experience and in the coverage of news, however unsavory the topic, the fundamental tenets of journalism would have application. Why should we care or not care? Is this an isolated development or part of a larger context? What is there beyond what we are currently showing you on the screen? What are the facts as approved to the conjecture? It is the application of journalistic principles that is missing or underrepresented these days in too much of what we see and hear in this new universe. Those principles are the compact that we have with our viewers. It is what they expect of us. 
we should expect no less of ourselves. Occasionally, even when we believe those principles are firmly in place, the assumptions are about as sound as the ground beneath the San Andreas Fault. Election night 2000 was a painful reminder of the absolute need for persistent vigilance and maintenance of standards in a climate of competitive pressures forcing the tectonic plates of change. Never mind that we later discovered that the voting procedures were more broken than our projections, especially in the state of Florida. As embarrassing as it was for those of who sat out there that night with omelet all over our suits, the one small comfort came in our ability to instantly acknowledge our errors. It was Reuben Frank's transmission of experience to a fault. And parenthetically, may I just add here that my friends in the gold standard of print journalism in America have also undergone some embarrassing experiences in the past year. They too have been forced to examine their standards and practices in a new way in the most public fashion. Their readers may be slightly more skeptical now, but I trust that they're also grateful for the self-examination. For too long, American journalism was too reluctant to admit error or to share with its readers and viewers the broad outlines of its decision-making process. Indisputably, the time and the competitive pressures now are much greater for the readers, for the viewers, and for those of us in the cockpit. If I may, I'd like to offer a brief outline of the Brokaw theorem. It's a new law of journalistic physics. A piece of matter of undetermined origin, reliability, or importance gets sucked into the news cycle sometime in the early morning hours in some fashion, maybe just a joke or a rumor on the internet. It may be a piece of gossip, malicious or otherwise. It catches on in the early morning radio talk circuit where fact check is more likely to be the name of the female traffic reporter than a standard practice. By mid-morning, all of the cable news outlets are treating it as an unsubstantiated report, and it's now making its way onto the local news broadcast as well. It's already been on a number of websites since about 5 a.m. By late afternoon, it is giving my colleagues and me a collective migraine headache. Where in the hell is this coming from? It must be something because there it is now on the late afternoon cable news free-for-all. There's a former U.S. attorney or a campaign press secretary or a red meat ideologue or a drip dry think tank habitue commenting knowingly on the unsubstantiated report. It is difficult enough for me. Consider the viewer. Consider also the viewer with access to what amounts to an internet chain letter. He or she can be taking it all off the large screen, immediately transferring it to the smallest screen, and before long, it hits critical mass across America. It becomes fixed in the consciousness of the country. It is a peril enhanced by the ever greater blurring of the line between what is the role of reputable and well-established reporters in the mainstream and the role of the so-called pundits and commentators on cable and talk radio. Even the most discerning and vigorous viewer must be confused by the slippery place of journalists who appear on one medium as reporters and a moment later on another medium as commentators and pundits. So what are we to make of this new world where there is a great anxiety about whether the Darwinian principles of journalism are leading forward to a bright new age of unlimited news and information dissemination and retrieval or doing a steep dive into the primordial ooze? Personally, I'm much more inclined toward the former than I am to the latter. I think we must take care not to judge the whole by the most sensational but least significant parts. Still at an age and a stage in my personal and professional life when I would prefer to shift to cruise control, I know that neither I nor my colleagues can go on autopilot. We are not immune to the great evolutionary forces at work in our medium. As it is a new world for healthcare providers, for warriors, for educators, politicians, businessmen, and women, spiritual leaders, so too is it a new world for us. 
it is much more competitive. The marketplace, journalistic and economic, is much less forgiving. The audience is not nearly as homogenous nor as structured as earlier stewards may have thought. As we learned again recently in Chicago, the collision between reality and wishful thinking can be pretty jarring. A local Chicago news outlet returned to a more sober format with a highly regarded and very skilled anchor leading the way with all of the attendant positive promotion. It failed to hold its own, losing audience steadily as it went along, and the experiment was canceled. I cannot resist noting, by the way, that in the Chicago newspapers, first the cheering and then the lamentations of television critics for the experiment were in pages of publications that also print horoscopes, comic strips, advice to the lovelorn, sports scores, gossip of 15 minutes, celebrities, and crossword puzzles. I've often wondered what newspaper could thrive by going to press with only the front and editorial pages. Still, however we organize our journalistic efforts and present the finished product, we must be guided by certain well-defined and understood principles. Just as there are fundamental principles of astrophysics that govern the behavior of real stars and planets, so too are there fundamental principles that govern or should govern our place and behavior in this new universe that we are privileged to occupy. First, news is change. What's new? What's different? But new alone is not enough. We should also apply the test of importance, which very often is in the eye of the beholder. Then, if it is new, important, and true, how do we determine and demonstrate the truth? And if not the truth, how about just the facts? If it is new, important, and true, what is the effect and the context? Also, where does it fit? After all, daily journalism is also about the oh my god elements of life, the arresting picture, the unexpected and riveting event that may not have lasting consequence, that moment of humanity that can be so reassuring. Finally, if it is new, important, and true, how do we present it in such a way our viewers can be engaged by it and recognize it as something that they should know? These principles are neither staid nor toxic. They are critical to the health of the profession and to the bond between the viewer and the news producers. They have not disappeared, but their place seems to have been diminished in the daily struggle to master this new universe. I have believed for some time that it might be useful to conduct an experiment that I heard from a man by the name of Harold Agnew, who ran Los Alamos for a period of time. He was one of America's top nuclear scientists. He was present at the creation of the nuclear age, and when I asked him, if he had the power to do anything, given the political reality of the nuclear age, what was it that he would do? And he said, I would take anyone who comes to power, however small their domain in the world in a given year, and place them on an isolated Pacific Island atoll, and strip them naked, and turn their back to a far more distant Pacific Island, and set off a low-yield nuclear device so they could feel for themselves the heat and the power of a nuclear explosion and to know what they're then dealing with. Were it left to me, I would take anyone who comes to power in American journalism and make them the subject of a news story unleash on them, their competitors, their colleagues, and others, and tell them that the story is going to be in the front page of every newspaper in America and in the style sections of those papers as well. <laughs> so that they would have a keen understanding of what it is that too many people, unsuspecting and innocent, go through and what other people who step into the public arena determined in some way to enhance this great republic, what they go through as well. I'm personally grateful for the most part, he added parenthetically, 
of the work of the Committee for Excellence in Journalism. I think that Bill Kovach and Tom Rosenstiel have performed a great service to our profession and the public in their new book, The Elements of Journalism. I may differ with them pretty vigorously on some parts, but the overall effect is instructive and useful and provocative. It is a timely reminder of the principles that are necessary to the continuing health of journalism everywhere, but especially in a society privileged to be governed by the First Amend Amendment, a society that is undergoing this explosion of availability of news and information in so many new media. While they occasionally fray my fragile anchorman's ego, I also welcome the growing presence of designated press critics and ombudsmen in the public press. I noted with some interest today that Michael Gettler, who is the ombudsman now for the Washington Post, has to move his report back to Thursdays because when it was coming out on Fridays, it so interfered with those who were writing on the Sunday newspaper deadline, they weren't getting their things done. It was reassuring to me to know that those journalists on that side of the spectrum, like those of us in on my side have what my old friend, the late John Osborne, called the classic glass jaw of journalist. <laughs> we throw punches all day long, but as soon as someone winds up and looks as if they may throw a punch at us, we go down whining and screaming in great pain. <laughs> Moreover, I strongly believe the place of my medium in all of its forms is so pervasive and so provocative, it has a fundamental obligation to receive as well as to send. In the past, I have participated in town hall meetings on the press in places like Phoenix and Pittsburgh and Minneapolis. I never failed to come away with a better understanding of that vital but delicate link between my side of the screen and the viewers. After almost 40 years in this profession, in small towns and on the world stage, for the last 20 years at every crisis around the world, every moment of triumph, constitutional crises, wars, natural disasters of epic proportions, social and economic upheaval, scientific triumphs and great personal tragedies, I have one enduring primary conclusion. The people take us seriously. We fulfill our obligation to them and our place when we return that favor. They are empowered, and that should not be overlooked. And so are we by the riches of this new universe that we occupy together. We've now gone quickly past that memorable 19th century Chicago newspaper credo, print the news and raise hell. While it remains a stirring rallying cry, the fact is that we live in a far more complex world. As this new world takes shape beneath our feet and before our eyes on a daily basis, we cannot just randomly stumble forward, guided only by instincts for that day's survival. But neither can we be dismissive of the appetite of viewers and readers for a rich variety of choices engagingly presented, whether serious or trivial. We owe it to ourselves, our calling, our time and place to raise it to a higher station we should have a constant and wide-ranging dialogue on the powers that we have been privileged to exercise. I hope that this evening is one small step forward in that necessary colloquy. Thank you all very much for your attention. We're going to have uh, questions now. I would uh, ask that those of you who have questions go to one of the four microphones here, there, and there are two up here. And when you ask your question, please identify yourself. And we ask, please, we would only have a limited time, so please don't make a speech. Just ask a <laughs> cryptic question. Young man. Thank you. Um, my name is Josh Weiner. I'm a sophomore from New York. Uh, since election night, you've acknowledged the need for reform in election coverage. You discussed it even a little bit tonight. 
But uh, it seems that your network, NBC, has been a little bit reluctant to do the same. Other networks, such as ABC and CNN, have recently uh, discussed reforms they plan to make, but NBC hasn't issued similar reforms. And in fact, your, uh, your news president in the recent congressional hearing uh, defended NBC's record while the other networks were uh, discussing these reforms. I'm curious if NBC does plan to reform the way they cover election coverage, and if so, what you plan to do. No, we hope to make the same mistakes four years from now that we made. <laughs> no, in fact, we have. We have uh, issued a report. Tom Goldstein, who's the dean at uh, the Columbia School of Journalism, was one of the chairs of it. And uh, it was out the same day, Bill Wheatley, as what, the ABC or the CNN? CNN. CNN. The same day that CNN issued its statement. It was not as lengthy, but uh, we issued it as well. Let me just take a moment and talk about um, if I can, you all now have a pretty good idea of what happened. It was a classic case of a collapse of a system where we had bad data and we, and, and we took it for granted. Uh, we relied too much on uh, historic patterns that were changing rapidly in that state. Um, my own very strong belief is, despite the confidence of some of the people who testified before Congress, that it will be very hard for us to make projections based on exit polls four years from now. In, in large part because of the rising phenomenon of absentee ballots. Most states are now making it much easier for people to cast an absentee ballot. Some of the change I was talking about here tonight takes place on election day as well. So if you get up to a 40 percent uh, of an absentee ballot, we're not going to be able to determine what happened with a big chunk of the electorate that day. Now, I said in this forum, a couple, was it two years ago, Marvin, when I was here, that I would change things radically. I've been troubled by this for some time. I would move Election Day from the first Tuesday in November to the first weekend in November. I'd open all the polls simultaneously, you know, 6 a.m. on uh, East Coast, and midnight in Hawaii, go for 36 hours, vote through the weekend with an ATM card, far more uh, secure now. And people could vote in uh, shopping malls and football stadia and other places that they are. And then at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday night, say, uh, at noon, Hawaii, all the way across the country, polls close simultaneously. You have an electronic readout. You have the Super Bowl of politics. You have uh, salsa parties going on, you know, and uh, <laughs> beer sales would go up, pizza sales would be great. Uh, so I honestly think that we have to have a real extraordinary effort at election reform. It's crazy that this system, which we, did, which we value so highly, the right of the, the vote and the weight of the vote, is as broken down as we now know that it is. And the problem with reform is that it has to come from those people who got into power under the old system. So they're not inclined to do that. They want to keep their hands on the machinery as much as possible. That's why we don't have campaign finance reform, by the way. Okay? Thank you. Hello. My name is Zachary Norman. I'm a first year at the college. And I just wanted to know, in light of the spread of the availability to receive news and the increasing number of news sources, what do you see as the future of the n network nightly 30-minute newscast? <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, th th that's a good question. And I don't know. I, we've done some projections on it. We think it's good for another 10 years, probably, at roughly these numbers. People like, we had this discussion at dinner tonight, there are still enough people beyond your generation, your parents and others who are going to be around who like their news organized in that way. They've grown up with this tradition. The more interesting question is what happens when you get to be in your 50s and 60s and whether you'll have any interest in, in a network news broadcast. My own strong belief, and there's a kind of an AP story about it today, about the three of us and what we've been through for the last 20 years. I, I've always hoped that, that we would have a 10 o'clock primetime newscast that would go for an hour. Um, and you could fiddle with the format in a couple of ways. You could do some of that kind of Today Show format, in which you, the local stations get a few minutes, you know, at the bottom of the half hour, and then again, and then they get to go to their 11 o'clock news. I don't know whether that'll happen in my professional lifetime or not. So it, I think that that's one of the reasons that we have to keep doing what we're doing, which is looking at the form, making sure that we're covering the important stories, but addressing other stories as well. If you go back just 12 years, for example, and look at all three broadcasts, they were pretty much animated wire services. They would do kind of 12 stories in a row, maybe one longer story on a big story of the day, but everything else, if it happened somewhere in the world, it would likely get some kind of mention in the network news that night because they were the only broadcasts that were available that day. We now know that when people come to us that they've had access to all this other material. So how do we carve out our place in that? And that's an ongoing dilemma for us. 
Yes. Yes, sir. Um, Joseph Donzelman from New Jersey. I'm a first year in the college. And my question is, what is the source, what is the origin um, in the major news networks of the left-wing bias, and will there be an end to it in, <laughs> in the near future? <laughs> Oh, God, it's, uh... I would think so. Well, I, honestly, I, I, I must say I have some trouble with the premise of your question. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me respond, however, uh, in a kind of more general fashion than you may like. Uh, look, reporters are involved in change. They're involved in what's new, what's different. And people who have conservative ideologies, for the most part, kind of like, by and large, things the way they are. They don't like a lot of change. So there's this perception that if we're involved in change, it, I remember when it really blew up in America, I think that the origin of this were during the Civil Rights Movement, that network correspondents were, came to be called communists on the streets of the South or in the big cities later, because they were out reporting this enormous social change that was going on. And that's what happens, by and large, is that I think a lot of people look at us and say, well, you must be left-wing or liberal because look at these issues that you're dealing with. And we do tend to deal with those issues that represent societal changes, uh, whether they're economic or political or, um, or in, in, the case, in this case, both social and, and racial. If you look at what's on the air now, I mean, I know that Fox says, we report, you decide, on cable. But their biggest stars are pretty outspoken in terms of their conservative tilt. Uh, Bill O'Reilly is a Boston product, graduate of the school, in fact. Uh, uh, if you look at what happens even on MSNBC, I think you find more people to the right of center than you do to the left of center in terms of what they're defending and what they're promoting. It's worth pointing out, I have these arguments with my closest friends, by the way. In the years that I've been covering politics at the presidential level, the most serious, enraged complaints that I've gotten have come from the left, not from the right, directly, <coughs> from presidential candidates and others about our coverage, screaming that we were being unfair to them. I just had a, an episode, an, an experience, rather, on election night that was fairly instructive to me. Uh, about a week after the election night, I read in the Wall Street Journal op-ed page uh, a conservative radio talk show host in Los Angeles who was um, railing about what had happened in the country because we're still going through the election recounts in Florida. And then he said, if there's any question about how liberal the media are, Brokaw on election night said, referring to Al Gore, we still have to win, dash, dash. God, I never said anything like that called Tim Russert, who was at my side. We, we kind of acted as each other's radar on those occasions. I said, you remember me saying anything like that? And he said, no. We went through the transcript, couldn't find it. Uh, we called him and said, where did you get that? And he said, well, no, I don't have the phrase quite right. What you said is that we still must win this state. So then we called up the videotape and looked at it. And I was doing a whole run of states. And I said, OK, Pennsylvania goes to Al Gore now, but we still have to call Michigan and Ohio. Those are going to be important states. And when we, and we must call those states, and then they said in my ear, Michigan goes to Gore. I said, we must win, Mich Gore wins Michigan. That was it. That became a left-wing bias in his eye. So bias like beauty is very often in the eye of the beholder. I think over a long period of time, it really all works out in a fairly balanced fashion. But I've been defending it in forums like this and in other places for as long as I can remember. Thank you. Yes. I'm a student at School of Public Health, and uh, I, um, I think the NBC uh, News has successfully raised the American public's awareness of many health-related issues. And I would like to know how your team goes about selecting these issues and how you decide what the American public should know about health care. Thank you. Well, I think there's been a uh, general growing awareness uh, that uh, people are taking more responsibility for their own health care and wanting and having a, 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 a greater curiosity about it, uh, wanting more information about it. I don't know anybody who just goes to a doctor now and does whatever the doctor tells them to do. Moreover, uh, the health care industry 
has opened up in terms of wanting to share with the public a lot of this stuff because it really does help uh, the healthcare industry to have a more informed patient population, if you will. And then finally, there have been so many dramatic advances in the last 10 years in the healthcare sciences that it's just a good story. It's an important story. Uh, in my own case, I come, I married into a family of physicians. I have a daughter who's a physician, and I'm interested in what she's doing constantly because she has, and her area is in public health. She's really interested in what's going on in public health. I don't think that there's anything that's more critical to, the, to a stable society than to have a population that is healthy. And so it's a legitimate issue for us, but it is not one that was covered much when I first began in this business. So we have specialists in this area, and it's one of the areas in which we've developed that interest. I'm Teresa House. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm a freshman at the college. I was also a regional rec recruitee. Um, <laughs> basically, the question that Difference I have. Difference is you got in and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the basic question that I have for you is that the decrease in the amount of time allocated for sound bites from, poli from political yeah. figures seems to correspond with the rise in hiring PR people within campaigns, like officially embracing spinning yeah. within your campaign. And so my question for you is, what do you see as the ideal sort of ratio between the direct quotation of the po politicians themselves and the commentary that you as journalists provide on it? Yeah, it's a, I was glad Alex raised that at the outset, and I was also happy that he also took note of what happens, what's happened in the print medium since then. Um, look, our whole, whole pace of life has changed in the last 20 years. Music is different than it was then, too, and uh, we compress, we do more multitasking than we did then. That has something to do with it. But the difference between then and now is that there are so many other places now that you can hear the whole speech on C-SPAN or on cable or in a lot of other places. And at Nightly News, and I'll give you the origins of it, I don't think I've ever discussed it publicly before. We have something called In Their Own Words, in which we let a candidate or somebody who's involved in a public issue describe for themselves in a minute and a half or two minutes without a reporter there, but it's produced by somebody who has journalistic uh, credentials. We do have a gatekeeper overlooking the process. This began because I was watching, I'm a C-SPAN wonk, and on, this is the exciting life of a television anchorman. On a Saturday night, <laughs> uh, on a Saturday night in 19, uh, after the election in 94, after the Republican Revolution, I was watching the freshman Republican class, brought to Washington by Newt Gingrich, uh, having a colloquy with uh, Rush Limbaugh and Bill Bennett about what they should expect for the next couple of years and how they should conduct themselves. And there it was buried on C-SPAN on Saturday night and it was utterly fascinating to me because they kind of laid out their blueprint about what they wanted to do. And I thought, how do we get that on the air? We don't have anybody there. How do we now revive that and get it on the air on Monday night? And how do we come up with a technique that we can do that as we go along for not just political people, but people who are involved in natural disasters or people who have something to say about the economy. So we created something called In Their Own Words. And that Monday night, we had a combination of the two of them talking to the class without a reporter between them and the audience. And I think that it's something that is a new form that has served us well, frankly. We're stacked up over here. Why don't we have one more from here? Um, my name is Andrew Moraz. I'm a first year uh, master in public policy student here. Um, my question is about ethical standards that uh, news organizations maintain. Are traditional standards that they've held for a long time still applicable? Can you still maintain them with the shorter news cycle and you know, ownership of, of, of you know, media organizations? Or do they change in terms of sourcing in terms of how you treat a story, checking facts. Well, we don't have situational ethics, if that's what you're asking, but constantly they're being re-examined and sometimes they're being fine-tuned given the changes that are going on in the world in which we're living at that time. One of the big changes at, at NBC, I think that it's fair to say, Bill Wheatley is a Neiman graduate and is one of our vice presidents, and this is one of the areas that he keeps track of. He has someone who came up through the ranks at NBC, David McCormick, who is kind of our ethics cop and he reviews a lot of things, and we're constantly looking at sourcing and uh, 
the presentation of material, whether we've been fair or not, especially when we get complaints from people who say, wait a minute, I was just totally misrepresented on that. So we go back, and if they've got a case, then we make the correction on the air. Also, something that you haven't thought about, maybe, is that the public lecture business for correspondence of some visibility is a, you know, is a real source of outside income for them. And we have a rule at NBC that we instigated about five, six years ago, I guess, Bill? Yes. Yeah. That you can't, that you can't, one of our, our correspondents, our Washington correspondents and others cannot uh, take fee for speech from an organization that is involved in Washington in some fa fashion in lobbying. And that's one of the rules that no one had thought about before. So yeah, we're constantly looking at that. But truth in advertising here, there is, it's such a scramble to get things on the air anymore that it is not something that is at the top of our agenda every day. And that, that's what I was trying to address here. It's something we have to pause and think about and maybe even restructure physically within these news organizations about how we deal with it. When I was a White House correspondent, during Watergate, I would work all day long on a story and button it up and get it tight and get it ready and share with New York what my sources were, either by name or by position, more likely, and go on the air with John Chancellor at 6.30, and John and David Brinkley were there. Seven o'clock, I would have another three, four hours of nighttime work to do to get ready for the Today Show. Now, seven o'clock, Claire Shipman, David Bloom, one of our correspondents, uh, David Gregory in this case, and Campbell Brown, Andrea Mitchell. Seven o'clock, they're off the air, they hit a switch, and they're right on MSNBC. And they may be on there for a long run, you know, from seven until nine, or they need to come back and do Brian Williams at 9.15. And so there's this enormous pressure on them uh, that takes away from their opportunity to run down stories, to do original reporting, and that's a dilemma that we're still dealing with in this chaos of this new universe that we're creating. Hello, my name is Hans Palmatanso. I'm a senior at the college. Um, I hear constantly from my uh, European and Latin American friends here at the college that uh, reporting back home is, is so much better than here in the U.S. It's more objective that governments are, uh, are questioned and criticized much more effectively. Um, how, how do you feel about uh, these comments? Have you heard them? And, and how do you feel the, the media in the U.S. is, is lacking or is praiseworthy of, of, how, of how it goes about uh, criticizing or, or analyzing its government? Well, I, um, I, I, su I suppose what I think is that I certainly, um, I think some of the individual European countries, if you go to Germany or go to um, UK or go to France, that they do more what would be described as foreign reporting than we do. They live in a slightly different environment. The European Union now is going on and things are happening right on their borders in a way, and we've always been more insular in this country. Now there's less foreign reporting that is going on now, but it's a different kind of world. At Nightly News, what we've decided to do is not do just episodic foreign reporting because it happens to break through. We're gonna do something when uh, we can engage the audience in a way by working harder on a larger story. A perfect example was the other night in The Hague when uh, the Serbs were found guilty of war crimes. We had worked on that for three weeks running. And rather than just say that this trial was underway and it was still going on, we waited for the verdict and then we did this very comprehensive report. I, it's hard for me to say that, hard for me to make a judgment about whether they do a better job of, of uh, being more critical or analytical about their own governments. I, I think that we're pretty tough on our own governments to sometimes to a fault. Uh, I think that we got into a, and you really want to know what I think, I really think we got into a situation where we were playing gotcha constantly when we were looking at uh, the public arena. Dean and I and I've talked about this, whether or not that helped drive the country away from its institutions of governance and discourage people from coming into the arena. Um, uh, this is a new opportunity with George W. Bush, and he has some ideas that he wants to try out, and we'll see how that goes in the next three months. And one of the things that we have to do is kind of step up our game and 
uh, analyze a lot of stuff that is not necessarily television oriented. The tax cut is a good example of that. So is the Social Security privatization plan. These are critical issues. So is this whole nuclear program, by the way. Not just the missile defense shield, but what he's going to do in build down and what kind of a nuclear world we're going to have. Um, so those are things that, for you to keep your eye on and, and let us know if you don't think we're doing a good enough job. Thank you. Uh, first off, Mr. Burke, I'd just like to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm a first year at the college, Tyson Hubbard. Um, you've had such an uh, illustrious long career and so many firsts. What do you think was the most important story you ever covered, and wh which story was most exciting for you to cover? Well, I, I get asked that a lot, obviously, now. And uh, I have kind of two answers. A lot of times people will say, who is the most memorable person that you've ever interviewed, or who, who sticks in your mind? And they always think it's, I did the first interview with Gorbachev, for example, or the day that John Kennedy was killed, or covering Bobby Kennedy and then seeing his assassination, covering Dr. King, uh, and a lot of other people. The, the people who stick in my mind are the ordinary people whose names I don't even know, who showed great courage in the face of um, uh, great adversity, um, first in this country in the civil rights movement. But when I really saw that was uh, in 89 with the collapse of communism. That's the single biggest story that I've covered. Um, Right below it is Richard Nixon's resignation. But I think that over the long curve of history, the collapse of communism, as dramatic as it was and as sweeping as it was, uh, is something that I've, we're still trying to come to grips with that, frankly. Um, it, there were times during that story when I couldn't believe that I was uh, reporting what I was seeing. Um, 89 was one of those years like 68. 68 Dr. King, Bobby Kennedy killed. We had the 68 conventions. We had Ch Johnson saying that he wasn't going to run again. Uh, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, put a man on the moon. All these things were going on in 68. I'll never see another year like that. 89 comes along. Soviet Union collapses, Poland collapses, Czechoslovakia collapses, Mandela is released, and Tiananmen Square happens. I mean, those are astonishing events. Uh, so I would say those two years but probably 89 for the long reach of history will have the greatest effect. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a question, not as an anchorman, but as a managing editor of the news program. Um, Who are you? My you name do, is Marina yeah. Simone. I'm not a student anymore here. Um, uh, the question is about today's news and being well aware that you are here. I don't know if you participated in the decision of what's going to be on a broadcast tonight or not. But as you probably heard, um, and on a recount by Washington Post and um, uh, Miami Tribune, the, the, if, even if the votes were counted that were ruled by United States court unconstitutional, Gore would have only encountered another 44 votes. I can almost bet if the recount was opposite and Gore would have won by five votes, it would have been a prime story, a very first story you would have on the news. Why did it not make a bleep on your tonight's broadcast at all? Oh, you mean the Knight Ritter? Mm -hmm. The Knight Ritter judgment? Well, because it was, Knight Ritter did it and there's still people counting down there. Tonight's broadcast, tonight's news, on uh, your tonight's They news. didn't mention it at all? Uh, if they did, they mentioned it so late that I had to be on a way No, here. They, that's right. But <laughs> it was on last night's news, by the way. It was on last night. We talked about it. And I, I said, make sure that you get it in, even though it was last night's story and this morning's development. I said, make sure that we, that we mention it. And it's the Knight Ritter count. So um, it, it, it didn't change anything. It wasn't an attempt. It wouldn't it have changed anything, even if Gore won by five votes. We still would have Bush as a president. But I bet you it would have made a very first story on the news. Well. You're, you're entitled to your opinion. Uh, if, if it had happened last night the same way and it was on again this morning and it was a five vote difference, if Gore had won Miami Dade by five votes, we would have led with it and made a big deal out of it. I'm, I can assure you we wouldn't have, because it wouldn't have changed it. Two more questions. Hi, my name is Lara Satrakian. I'm a first year at the college and I hail from the New York, New Jersey metro area. Um, my question concerns the fact that Naturally, there's a lot more than two 30-minute segments of news available daily in our world. Yet at the same time, I think both because of the mounting freneticism in American life and also what I really think is just this, this, this 
terrible, I mean, we're, we're overwhelmed by the smorgasbord, this variety of news that the best case scenario, if someone has five minutes to watch the news, if they're, best case scenario, they get the five minutes of great, relevant, truthful information. Maybe worst case scenario, they get someone's opinion that it will be the only information they receive in the day. And with such limited time and such a huge variety of options, if you were a consumer of mass media, where would you go for the truth? And seeing the inside and the outside, what, where do you go for the truth? This is almost a setup. <laughs> <laughs> well, i just tell you what my daily practices are. Maybe that'll be helpful, okay? I read a lot of newspapers every day. Uh, I read, uh, I have delivered to the house uh, stacks of papers, uh, all the principal New York dailies and the Washington Post and the Financial Times and um, you read them all? And, and, the, and, the, and the Herald Tribune, the International Herald Tribune. Well, I scan them, yeah. And I do, I'm good at multitasking. I, you know, I sit there and if, truth be told, 6.45 to 7 o'clock, I have a large black cup of coffee with my dogs pawing at me to take them out and I listen to Imus from 6.45 to 7. <laughs> I catch the Today Show from 7 to 7.15, so I know what they're doing at the top of theirs. Then I, then I, uh, and I succumb to, their, uh, to the dogs' overtures to me, and we go to the park with my radio on, and I listen to NPR for the next half hour. And I come home at uh, 7.45, and I go back through the papers and get on my computer and read uh, the overnight wires and do a little computer traffic with uh, my colleagues and pick up some other stuff. And, and uh, then I try to do a little workout before I get to the office. That's how I start the day. Uh, now, if it were left to me, uh, the other networks would suffer a California power crisis and we'd be left alone. Uh, <laughs> but look, the other thing that I didn't talk about is that I made only fleeting reference to is that the, that the news viewer reader, the user of, the, of this information, is more empowered than ever before. With the small screen, the large screen, all the newspapers that are available on these screens, the, it's astonishing to me, and I'm a pretty active user of it, how quickly you can go in and get the stuff that you want. My hometown of Yankton, South Dakota, population 12,000, maybe, on a good day, has a daily newspaper, has a daily newspaper. I read it on the net. I find out, you know, I call my friends who are in medical practice or they're doing things there, and I find out about it. I go right into the Yankton P&D. And I can even type in my name on the Yankton P&D and see what they've been saying about me back there, <laughs> which is also pretty useful, by the way. So my point is that this compact is two-way. It depends on you and your intellectual determination and your own curiosity to get out there and use it and to be I know that Tom and, and Bill have written about this in Elements of Journal. They say, well, they're not news consumers. But in a way, we are news consumers. And how we make the test of the information that we're getting. Now, having said all that, the other conclusion that I have after being doing this for so long, the public is great in terms of its judgment. It may get it wrong in the first pass sometimes. But the, the public has a longer view than those of us in our business. We're so caught up in telling them what's going on every second they tend to kind of take it in, digest it for a while, absorb it, figure out what they want to do with it, and then make a judgment as they go along. And so I, I am very heartened by the ability of the American people to use this information wisely and to reach out to a lot of sources and to come to the appropriate conclusions for their own lives. And it's very exciting to be living through this era in which they have so many other choices. I spend a lot of my time in a very remote part of Montana. And I've got a small dish and a laptop. And I am as wired to the world as I am in New York City. And the fishing's a lot better, by the way. Final, <laughs> final question up here. Oh, hi, Mr. Broca. It's great to have you here. Um, my name is Bianna. I'm a first year at the college. Uh, last year, we had a forum about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we had a lot of the people, a lot of people very informed about the crisis itself, including Secretary McNamara, who said that one of the crucial things in President Kennedy's decision at the time was the fact that the media gave him some time to think about his decision, and that he had a week to just go and think about the 
matter at hand, and he said that he didn't think that today uh, a president would be given that amount of time by the media, and I just want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've actually participated in forums uh, about that very subject before, about decision making in this in this uh, super heated uh, greenhouse in which we all live now. And I th personally believe that if the White House has the courage, it can hold us at greater arm's length. Now, I don't want you to run down and tell George W. Bush this. <laughs> but I always thought the one who did the worst job of dealing with the pressures that came from all of us was Jimmy Carter. They tried to respond to everything that was going on, and they tried to get on the 6 o'clock news with their story and didn't kind of know what it was. People who did it the best were the Reagan people. They determined every day what it was that they wanted to get out there. They didn't get stampeded by those of us in the press room or those of us on the outside, uh, as is their right. Now, it, that makes, means that we have to work harder at finding out what's going on. But you're quite right. A president can get stampeded in this kind of an environment because it seems to be all around them. And they have to make a judgment about what's more important, about responding quickly or responding correctly and asking for a little more time. Now, here's a, here's a, well, we'll see what happens later this week with Bill Clinton, whether he feels that he has to respond, for example, to the presidential pardon question and the format in which he does respond. That will be interesting to watch. Thank you all very much. To, um, I want to tell you that uh, those of you who are interested, uh, we will be having a forum tomorrow to discuss what Tom Brokaw has said here tonight and other things involving uh, the issues that he is uh, certainly qualified to comment on as well. We have a distinguished panel, including uh, Bob Putnam of the Kennedy School, uh, Mike Oreskes from the New York Times, uh, uh, we have uh, the editor of Wired Magazine and uh, John Gage from uh, my son Microsoft Systems, who will be here to who will be here to talk. This will be on the fifth floor of the Taubman Building. Coffee and such at 7:30. The uh, the forum will be at 8 o'clock. Once again, thank you very much, Tom Brokaw, and thank you all.